We are live. We are live, everybody. Thank you. Uh, happy Friday uh, to Brian here and Kevin. Thanks for joining us again uh, for another awesome week of bioactive live Q&A. Uh, the point of this show is to connect with the community, um, a broad range of community, soil lovers, um, you know, agricultural people, folks that are growing, trying to uh, better their lives, better their crops, and uh, reptile enclosures, reptile enthusiasts, um, people in the bioactive enclosure world. Um, that the, Those are the people that we're trying to connect with, and um, we're here to answer questions from those people live, uh, and we do this every single Friday. So with that, um, before we get into some questions here, and while people kind of start uh, filing in, um, you know, let's get an update from you guys. Uh, what's going on over there, Kev? So today I just put in a new little no-till spot. I was sick all last week, y'all. I was dead. I was sick bad. I just laid in bed for about five days straight. So today was the first day I've been out and about doing stuff. I um, just kind of checked on the gardens. I did a no-till spot, about a about an eight-by-three foot no-till spot. I marked it off first, and then um, whenever I do a no-till, I always give it one shovel turn. I'll just go through the whole section and just flip the soil. <clears throat> that way I can get my compost down in there. I can get IMO3, get chicken manure, whatever the case is. I did use all three of those things today. Um, and then um, that's going to be a spot for potatoes. Potatoes and okra is my plan. I'll go potatoes early and then go okra into the end of the summer. And I'll have three, I've got three no-till spots designated for vegetables. And then my oldest no-till spot is, uh, was created in 2016. So <clears throat> it's, it's the one that you see me always soil layering in and putting all the watermelons and things like that in that one against the fence. It's been there for quite some time. I haven't disturbed it at all, but I did look at it today and, um, I've got, probably 35 maybe 50 who knows little bitty seedlings just popping up out of that bed because all my cannabis that i bred i washed and then i took it back and did a bunch of stuff with it and one thing was i put it back into the no-till spots and those those buds will have seeds all the time and it's loaded that little bed is loaded with a bunch of little baby little baby seeds so my assumption is they're all fems, but I, none of them are going to make more than likely. But it's, they've been nice enough that they're starting to pop out of the ground. You know, it's been for a week now. It's been nice at my other business where I teach kids how to tumble. I've had my doors open all night long. Let the wind blow in. It feels good. It's around 60, 70 degrees around five o'clock here. So it's been really nice. Um, all the red buds are starting to bloom. That's the, pro that's the only problem. These nice days make these fruit trees and these little early blooming buds like red buds, Bradford pears, those kind of trees that like to show early. They, they're they starting to bud out a little bit, but then we get one more frost, it's gonna kill everything off and it won't do anything for the rest of the year. So I've had, I had, I had uh, fruit trees in my backyard for about five years and one year, the second year they put off some fruit, but then the, the next four to five years after that, they would bud just like this, and then we'd have a freeze come and kill it all off. I've had zero fruit. I don't want decorative trees. I want them doing something. So I cut them all down. That's the brutal thing here, too. It's obviously way too early for any sort of uh, <clears throat> budding going on or seedlings popping out of the ground naturally. Um but like April ish, you know, before the frost is completely over early April, late March, you know, we'll get like a nice warm spell where it'll be in the 60s for a week. And and like you said, Kevin, here at apples are big, um, more so at the end of the season, it screws things up when it does these these huge temperature swings. Um, but at the beginning of the year, same story, it can really screw up the cycle. Um slow things down kind of dictate a little bit what's going on with that year's growth so uh always an interesting thing to watch and it's a trip being in michigan here where we're getting on and off 
snow the last few days and no end in sight of the kind of the gray cold. So it's like to hear you saying you got seeds popping, uh, that's that's just wild. Tells you the, the huge swing in zones. Um, something to keep an eye on for sure. So uh, good update, Kev. Brian, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, um, so I, uh, my wife and I and a couple named Dan and Ray have been working behind the scenes for almost a year now, uh, trying to put a bunch of things in place. And we've been able to do that now. So not only am I in the isopod world and trying to make a, you know, a little name for myself there, I've been able to partner with somebody that's in the terrarium world that's already made a name for themselves. And they had a blog and they were uh, doing like affiliate marketing. I've been learning a lot from them. Uh, through what like affiliate marketing can actually do and bring you and all these things uh, for about two and a half years with them. And now that we have partnered up, uh, we basically have a shop with them uh, where we're working together to sell these terrarium products. They're uh, terrarium experts and we're trying as best we can to understand isopods, hopefully in the next few years at an expert level. Uh, and then with that collab, I think we're going to be able to really take over the bioactive stuff. And so that's what I meant when I was talking to you guys, like there's so many plates spinning right now uh, with all of my kids and everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's never ending, but at the same time, once we get over this little marathon here, I would love to have you guys be a part of this. I want to do more, you know, I'm, do, I'm teaching a class here in a couple of weeks where hopefully if that takes off, uh, there's just a lot of opportunity for all of us to continue to learn about bioactive things. And then I hope you guys see in real time that a lot of us are taking these soil uh, skill sets and making businesses or people are coming, you know, somebody came to me and asked me and my wife about if we wanted to be partners with them. So more people are watching you than you think. And I think if you just keep your head down and, and focus on reviews, which Mark, you know, you actually kind of taught me even with the, uh, what's, what's that called? Shopify, you know, just kind of learning from each other and helping each other out. And so then when you do have your train up and running, uh, another buddy can come and tell you like, hey, man, I added this on the track and I, now I'm getting more traffic. I think people obviously nowadays buy from reviews. So uh, that little gold bar that that Mark gave me has kind of changed a lot of things in, in the way that I've, I've been approaching uh, my business. And so I will give up money to make sure that I get a five star. review. The what about repeat. you, Mark? Yeah. So uh, over here. Sorry, man. I keep doing that to you. I'm going to stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, been a crazy week. I had to volunteer at my kids' uh, preschool. It's like a co-op preschool two times this week. Um, once today, once yesterday, and then this weekend uh, there is a winter ball for my four-year-old and my two-year-old. So uh, a lot of exciting stuff on the stay home dad front. Um, and my son is, uh, working on potty training. So that's been interesting. And, uh, yeah, he pooped on the floor today. So I'm sure that's the first of many to come here as we transition. And, uh, yeah, so I've been thinking about kind of like I was, we were talking offline. Kevin was saying, talking about um, he's putting in his beds and working the ground outside, which is awesome. Uh, you know, if I could get out there right now, I would definitely would. It's just picking through my Hugo culture beds. There, there's just clumps of frozen. You know, the, the, there's not a whole lot of activity going on, even on these 45 degree days. Um, so uh, just kind of, you know doing the best I can outside with the kids, having fun with them. Um, and then t thinking about what I'm going to be running next for genetics, uh, which I'm pretty excited about because uh, I got these blueberry lemonades, which you can't really see it, but it's uh, from Ray Kudronic. Um, these are, I believe, F3s that he ran out. Uh, these are watermelon coffee uh, times ice cream cake banana dog number two so um those are from ray crujonic and then i got some double sour jack and some purple pez from uh rising moon medicinals up north here in michigan both michigan guys um and uh yeah so it's it's some genetics that i can feel good about uh that i can you know be proud to 
talk about and show people and uh, people that I know are good, good, good men. So um, I wanted to show off your stuff, uh, but unfortunately with the with the blue screens oh. and stuff. But Does this is uh, Mark's right here. That doesn't work. Was it Dark Rainbow? I think right. Yeah, that's so. That's an archive uh, strain, but it's Dark Rainbow 2.0. Um, and uh, it's yeah, some really nice rosin. Fantastic, Kevin. What you got? That is Fem Pollen. If you can see it or not? There we go. That's Peach yep. Pistols from Kid Mac. We just got that about three days ago off his plants and tonight i'll be going in the gasoline alley and pollinating with his stuff this is kind of the pivot i'm doing from belief to something else just you know of course all that crap going down no need to talk about it but pivoting on to doing just something that i believe in a little bit more than what was happening with him but kid max a good dude we've been together now for well over a year um i watched him work that plant i watched him spray it <clears throat> we even tried a new method and it dumped the most fem pollen i've ever seen a plant dump i did i i still reversed the chester the cheetah which was the which was the one i was using to collab with belief so it's still reversed and i'm still probably going to collect pollen off of it but that jar right there is basically just going to get blown into gasoline alley and just go to town tomorrow is week three of the veg plant so they're they're ready to go for some pollen <clears throat> but that's to happen after this show all fems kev how do you um what's your like uh structure kind of on instagram for posting your garden update shots are you put are you doing mainly just natural inputs stuff like that on your at okay calyx and then is it on your genetic account that you're putting pictures of gasoline alley and kind of that process? Yeah. Is that how you're separating that? Yeah, I'm keeping the cannabis off the OK Calyx page and just keep it more of an organic growing kind of a thing. How to how to go get it, how to make it and use it in gardens or for anything. There will be some cannabis on there, but the genetics, the genetics is to get hammered. You know, when we start getting hammered for all the cannabis pictures and stuff like that. <clears throat> If it gets hammered, it gets hammered. But I swear, I post all kinds of cannabis pictures on there constantly, and nothing happens over there. But if I post something on OK Calyx that looks like cannabis, they're gonna hit me for it. I I just stay on that, you know, insight line. I'm just below zero constantly, just constantly right at zero. The crazy thing is, though, is that you don't even have to post that stuff, like it's so applicable to doing everything in the garden. And I think a lot of people, it's great to see a lot of people that either were just big into gardening that have started growing cannabis because it's legal or a big growing cannabis and have pivoted that knowledge to what they're doing outside growing plants for maybe just for their inputs. Some people, um, or just growing different plants in the backyard to, to attract diversity, um, or just to have one singular meal from something that cost you nothing. Like it cracks me up to see these videos or these like kind of these, or yeah, these memes about people that are like, I spent, you know, $300 on this, on this one carrot this season. You know, I don't know if you've seen those videos where it's like, it's like a, it's like a mom meme or, you know, it's like, this was stupid. I, I spent this much money and I only yeah, got a carrot. Six months and $40 and to get my two cent tomato finally. Right. Yeah. yeah a garden like, doesn't you're... pay off. A small garden doesn't, doesn't pay off. It really doesn't. It's probably cheaper to buy it at the market, but that's not the point. The point is you are trying to learn how to grow your own food. You can turn your whole backyard into a garden if you have to. I promise you it can be done, but when you first start out, you're not going to supply your family or yourself with anything. Maybe tomatoes. If you get enough, you can can them. You can make tomato paste out of them. You can do all kinds of stuff with them. Spaghetti sauce. Okra. If you grow a bunch of it, you can freeze it and, and take it out and, and re reuse it. So there are a few things that you could grow a whole lot of. But like to make it through the winter kind of a thing, we're all dead. Yeah, for sure. But the the beautiful thing about what, you know, the natural farming, Jadam, simple, simple farming practice, you know, that we all love to talk about is that it can be applied at scale, right? Like, 
um, you can apply at huge scale if you really wanted to p go to that direction. Um, or you can, method. yeah, or you can do just tiny scale in the backyard with your four by four bed, literally. Um, but the point is, is like refining your skills and learning how to do these things so that it's free. Use what you have. Uh, that's my favorite principle. You know, it's like, it's like ultimately this shouldn't cost anything, you know? Yeah, I mean, you got to find ways to, to make profit. I think one of the easier ways to do that uh, is with inputs and those kind of things. So, you know, my family just had shrimp before we came live on here, or at least my son and I did. So the, all those little tails that I have, I let them dry for 24, 48 hours, depending on kind of the moisture level. And then once they're dried out, you can crack them up and feed these huge fish tanks of uh, like very hungry protein. They're called the dairy cow isopods. Uh, so I spent 15 bucks at Costco that usually actually the amount of shrimp feeds my family twice. So it's like seven, seven dollars and 50 cents. And then whatever the, the, the skins and everything that are left over the, the exoskeleton parts that breaks down. And uh, the, it seems like it creates a lot of babies. So in my world, I'm able to create these inputs that I know uh, are feeding my family that then break down um, with the help of KNF inputs and IMOs and those kind of things. I mean, there has to be life in there, but it seems to break down so quickly that you'll start to see a bunch of babies and they have this little pink hue to them. And that's how, you know, they've been eating the shrimp because it kind of like gives, gives it away. And so there's a lot of ways that I feel like I am ahead of some of my competitors with the amount of money that I have to spend because I'm able to get leaves in bulk and I'm able to feed protein and chitin at a very, very, like, how we always say pennies on the dollar. That's the kind of stuff you have to figure out and whatever. I'm sure Mark is the same way. And obviously with, with IMOs with Kevin, I mean, that's kind of the whole point of it is that it's literally pennies on the dollar. So, uh, Gobble Grow said, since going KNF and Janam, everything I've grown from cannabis to peaches has been steadily improving. It's like, it's kind of one of those things once you start doing it and get into it uh, and you really see the final product, it's, it's hard to believe at first. And sometimes, especially if you're doing it with uh, store-bought products, you know, switching to a no-till system or even a bioactive system can seem like a very daunting, expen really expensive upfront cost. But if you, if you figure out how to, uh, you know, utilize what you got to minimize that, um, a or B, if you don't have that option and you have to spend that money, the fact that you're reusing your soil or your substrate, um, it truly does after a year of this, it truly does diminish what you're doing to basically nothing. Um, especially when you can consider having to buy substrate every single flip, you know, when you're in your 10th, 12th, 14th cycle, you know, you're on year two of these beds. You're like trying to, you're like giggling to yourself, trying to figure out how much you actually spent on that soil at this point, based on what you've gotten out of it. So, um, and there's something, a, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to say like with your stuff, I mean, there's something too. uh, I don't, I don't know, like probably the, the methods that you have Mark or whatever, but when I smoke this man, it makes me feel good. Like it's noticeable and, and. The reality is probably in like a couple of weeks that might wear off or whatever, because, uh, you know, I got these from you and everything. And I appreciate it. But there's something to, I think, when I'm starting to understand more when people maybe slightly believe or, or wholly believe in uh, more of the metaphysical aspects of the plan around it and the environment and all of those kind of maybe to some people silly nuances to some people. It is those percentages that start to add up and stack up. And I think when somebody cares about the plant in general, whether it's metaphysical or not, just putting in good work, I seem like I can always tell when I smoke that, that it's more of an uplifting feeling, even if it's supposedly indica, you know, it, it just seems like it maybe gives me a couch lock, but I'm giggling like a little schoolgirl sometimes. This is more uplifting to me uh, where I can focus and feel good. And that, those, that's the kind of stuff that I'm after being in my 40s is I, I want to feel good, too. Um, and I'm sure you guys are like, your back's hurt and all this stuff or you got like, it sounds all cliche, but it's starting to be that way. So I just enjoy uh, quality products because it, it allows me to kind of escape that throughout the day. 
Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, you know, the natural grown shit is just better. I, like that, the that stuff right there in that jar. There's a video I put up on on Instagram uh, of my son sprinkling some country roots dry amendments. I'm like trying to teach him how to put it around the base of the plant, and he just like dunks the whole freaking plant, you know, veg plant with this with this heavy powder amendment stuff. And uh, <clears throat> that's the that's that's one of those plants. You know what I mean? Like there was only three of those plants there um, that produced that. So that was that's and that's the stuff that was going on with the, those plants. Constant farmer shadow, you know, um, and, and constant love and intention. So I do think that there is something big to that portion of it for sure. So we actually, I just caught on Instagram. We do have a cup uh, a question. Uh, Nelson Seven wants to know: Do you guys add carbon to your outdoor, like burnt wood, into your beds? I add shredded wood, wood chips, bark. I add stuff like that. I have, I have burned a bunch of wood before and just scooped out ash and dumped it all over my garden. I don't do it that often. I've probably done it once in two years now, but. But like wood chips, like how I go out and get from stumps and all that stuff, bring it back, grind it up. Heck yeah, that is fantastic material in my environment, in my no-tills. Wood turns to beautiful soil probably in the summertime within five to six months. It's gone. It's just consumed. I second that. Um, and my, you know... Kevin posts all about his hacks on how he how he gets his wood chips, fucking beaver chips, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. But great places to get this stuff. Um, and if you can't get into the woods to do that kind of thing, what I found is if you can find an older uh, municipal, you know, spot, right, or even like a private one. If you're driving down the road, sometimes they just have little signs and a lot that says free wood chips. Um, you can go look at that stuff and make sure that it like seems good. You know, obviously I would check and make sure that there's not like a ton of like ants or anything crazy in it. But, um, I go right to the outside edge of those piles. I don't go for the, the new stuff. I go, I dig down around the bottom of the pile and I go for the stuff that's been sitting there for two years or even a year. Um, the stuff that's like clumped up with just, you know, mycelial microbial life. You can just tell it's the stuff you're looking for. Um, I load up on that. That's, that's what I love to use as, you know, as a filler kind of as like my lasagna layer with what you're talking about, Kev. Yeah. If you can add leaves or grass, Am I muted? No. If you can add leaves or grass or anything like that, that'll be just as good as throwing in some burnt ash. It's probably better to throw in some not burnt stuff, really. How would you make a seed starter K and F? There is a uh, there is an SES recipe out there, but I don't I don't know it. Look up it's S E S seed treatment something. But um look that up for K and F seed treatment. And it'll give you it'll give you a recipe. I don't I never use that. That is one of those things where it's like I tried it one time and then it was kind of like this is so unnecessary that I'm cutting it out of the repertoire. I'm just not doing it anymore because there's no need to. I just if usually I just put my seeds. This has nothing to do with your question, but it's how I do it. If my seeds can't go in dirt and have some water and start to live pretty soon, then that seed just did not make it. To have to baby my seeds so much is is too much for me. I don't baby any other thing that I put in my garden. The plants go directly into the garden or the seed, whatever it may be, goes directly into the soil. I keep it watered. I, so I expect it to start returning. And it's the same thing with cannabis. But, you know, I was one of those guys that came from gardening and introduced cannabis to my gardening, whereas the other people knew how to grow a lot of cannabis and then started learning how to grow some garden food stuff. But... You know, I've been in the gardens and the acres and the farms and everything like that for a long time growing foods, and there is no babying. There's no baby in it. The uh, only thing I consider ba babying is when they would actually put fertilizer on seed, you know, and you get these blue or green seeds and stuff like that, and it's just covered in a nitrogen mix. 
but that would be the only thing because i like my seeds just to fire up put them in the soil and fire them up but listen to this here's a fact you cannot start seeds in my compost they will eat whatever's they they will eat the seed they will crack the seed open and they will eat the inside of it and i don't know what they are but i have seen it multiple times they're itty bitty little bitty mite bugs and they can enter that seed crack and just start chewing the inside guts out of those seeds yeah so i can't start it in my compost it's got too much stuff in it i always start it i usually i usually typically what i like to do is go to my garden go to the no-tills and just grab some grab handfuls of soil and put them in a couple of trays and get a few things started that way that's typically how i do it yeah i think uh when, when it comes to seeds uh the soil is obviously important but less is more with, with those seeds like you really want something kind of basic um i've seen people try to even grow in like uh all worm castings and stuff like the nutrients it doesn't necessarily need to be at such a high level i think when people first start out with this but what I've noticed more when people first get into wanting to pop high-end cannabis seeds is they'll have their lights too far away. So they might have thought all through the soil systems, all this kind of stuff, and then they have a little seedling that's this long and it's starting to fall over. If you see that, that means that the plant isn't getting enough light. I see this time and time again with newer uh, like KNF farmers and, and living soil farmers. It's I don't know if nobody's saying this or whatever, but you want them to be almost stout, like inter, internodal spacing, all of the things that you probably hear us talking about, that that comes from making sure that that seed is getting enough light from day one. It has to start out just like a child. You know, you gotta make sure that it's constantly eating, constantly feeding, but you also have to protect it. You don't want too many things going on. So it needs enough light. That's why I always like to run T5s at first and then put them under some kind of LED and then especially in the early days, we'd run them under a metal halide and then a flower, they would get an HPS. I think now you can kind of, you don't need all the different lighting and stuff, but that was the process to make sure that it was getting enough light, but it wasn't too much light. And I think when you're, when you're dialing in your seed starter mix, you also have to dial in your lighting. Otherwise it's not going to transfer properly. And you're going to have these kind of like goofy looking seeds that have popped up and that if you don't get that light close enough, you've just wasted 100, 150, whatever you're spending on your packs uh, because of a, in my, in my opinion, almost like a peewee rookie mistake. Yeah. And even like the, just going back to what uh, Kev was saying about just something eating the seeds. Um, I, I just think that that's going to happen in any good biodiverse soil, even if it's like contained indoors or has a little bit of the wild from outside in it. I think springtails probably eat the seed. Uh, I think, you know what I mean? I think that there's, uh, you know, decomposing mites that you would consider beneficial generally in gardening. But for whatever reason, that seed is just not blowing those exudates yet or whatever whatever it is that's telling the, the these these organisms that, that it's good, you know, that it's part of the system rather than food for them to eat. So I don't know that it's necessarily like bad bugs that are eating the seed i just think that it's just good biodiverse soil can't you can't trust like seed popping um yeah it's too small you know unless yeah. you're throwing unless you're throwing 50 seeds down and like looking for just like you know the the keepers or whatever like that's why it works outside because the the strong survive but if you're down if you're if you're restricted to only like a handful of seeds or you're popping 10 or whatever, you don't want to run that risk. You want to get them established, get some legs on them and then drop them into the, the beds or into your crazy soil, you know, where all the, where the rodeo is. Yeah. Once the taproot has been established, they leave it alone. But if the taproot has not popped yet or anything, they will dig into the seed itself and harvest it. I've always heard, um, well, I guess some people say, I don't know if it's necessarily like fact, but because protein is so hard to get in mother nature that when you do put the seed in there and there's so much life in the soil, that's actually breaking things down, decomposers, everybody's more of like a predator with row beetles, springtails in this way are almost like a predator kind of thing, uh, that that seed's obviously not going to survive because everybody's pro programmed uh, to break down those proteins because it's very rare. And so 
I, I would love to hear maybe uh, Kevin's opinion on that, if there's any merit to that kind of stuff. But when you are going heavy, especially with IMOs and that kind of stuff, because that life needs so much uh, fuel and carbon, all those things, that, that protein's not going to last whatsoever because it's, yeah. it's, it's rare. Yeah, because, you know, the like kind of, if you will, the compost bugs, I guess, are trained. They're like, there's going to be food around here. And, you know, there always is some food going into those compost bins. There's always a little action activity going on. There's new stuff being introduced. So I wasn't sure if I totally caught your question, Brian, but the compost bugs are definitely trained to eat anything that goes in there. You know, they are ready to rock and roll. I have... In Gasoline Alley, I just saw last week, I saw a couple black soldier flies flying around. What that means is they had to have hatched out of that dirt. That, and that dirt is basically half compost, half IMO3. And so the conditions are warm enough in Gasoline Alley. And like I said, they have been the last week or so that those black soldier flies are, they came they came to life. I don't know how, I'm not the, I'm not the black soldier fly doctor whatsoever, but I am telling you, they are in Gasoline Alley. And I guarantee you they're coming out of my, my soil my compost and mixes that's in there because there's none outside it's still it's still too cold for them to be hanging out and be like yeah it's time to work the conditions are much more constant and stable in gasoline alley right now and so i think they came to life so uh, uh, an active soil is active if, if it's active it's active and if like you really if it's a good soil any soil i mess with if you throw a little bread down on it, a little wet bread, in a day or two, it's going to have hyphae growing all over it real soon. And that's just a good way to test it. Put some organic matter down there and see how fast it starts to consume it. And I'll tell you if it's good or not. Well said. Goathead Gardens uh, posted the SES from uh, Chris Trump's handout. Yes, he is, yeah. So that's, the, that's what the suggested mix is. So of like inputs. I'm mean, I'm assuming that's just like on a cocoa base or what. Basically, if I'm looking at that, I'm going to get. I'm going to get. Well, I'd go to about thirty-two ounces of water, which is a basic small bottle, and then I'd add one teaspoon of fermented fermented plant juice, half a teaspoon OHN, one teaspoon of brown rice vinegar. Shake that all up and use soak the seeds with it or whatever. I I would caution real quick though, like when it comes to Chris Trump, he he's fantastic, he's a brilliant guy, he brought a lot of stuff, but he wasn't necessarily a cannabis farmer. And sometimes with these ratios, especially when people put more than they should and it's not dialed in, that can fuck up your plants pretty hardcore. Or if you just go heavy with all the sugars when you're kind of playing around with cane up. I can fuck up your plants hardcore, especially with the IPM thing. So really go cautious with this kind of stuff and don't necessarily think that these ratios are set in stone for cannabis because people, highly intelligent people, have kind of followed that in the early days and they didn't see the same success that they had when they were running some earlier uh, things. So again, it's your skill set. So once your skill set is there, hell yeah, man, play around with stuff, get it there. But your goal at first is just to grow healthy plants. And I think sometimes kind of the same early mistakes, like with pH, PPM, trying to understand that when you're first getting into it, those, those same kind of mistakes are made when you're playing around with K and F ratios and you don't necessarily understand everything and you, whoop, or you put a little too much. That that makes a big difference when you're doing this. And if if you go heavy on it, you know, heavy handed on it, it can actually uh, fry some of your roots. Same, same shit with like the gray ice pots and all the the you know the people with the nightmares kind of scenario when i went when i went into organics and started growing it trying to figure out what it was like when i, I did gardening and it was it was totally organic the way i do it now then i got into cannabis and realized there's this whole organic thing that's going on and they have all these names and stuff abbreviations and whatnot and so i got into knf first and KNF is too difficult. It's just it was just like using salts in the sense of I am measuring constantly and I'm not a measurer. I'm just a this much kind of a guy and about that much and let's get it going. And I like to move on to the next thing. So I 
I wish I would have discovered you, Dom, first, but I, I tried to go through the KNF practices, and yes, basically I just kept messing up because I didn't I didn't take the time to actually go look exactly how much is one one to one five one to five hundred mixture in thirty two ounces of water. You know that's too much math now. Now I got to go ask my wife to do all these calculations for me because I don't know how to do it. And so then it was like, ah, oh, Jadam, man, this looks so simple and just my style and the way I've been doing stuff, really. And uh, that, so yeah, Jadam was so much easier. You're, you're, I, I could tell people if you'll start Jadam, you don't mess up. It just gets better. Everything you do just turns into back into JLF. It doesn't, does, you won't mess up. You know, it's, you can measure out you can put too rich of a jlf into a mix there's no doubt about it but man my plants seem to be able to take a lot of jlf whenever it's time to kind of feed them heavy they seem to take it and respond well and if i did that with you know if i if i overdid the water soluble calcium and the brown rice vinegar a little bit in the mix you know it's just not pretty what what starts to turn out but yeah jadam is easy those of you who are out there trying to get into this KNF stuff, I suggest that you you skip KNF. And that Chris Trump is KNF. It doesn't mean you skip Chris Trump. It just simply means the KNF practices. You can still learn from him all day long. But I would go to Jadam. You will find your life so much easier, and you're gonna be like, "This is amazing! I can't believe that this. I can't believe I haven't been doing this forever." But yeah, I don't spend any money, guys. I spend zero money on nutrients, zero money on soils, zero money on plants, and that's how I wanted it to be from the very beginning, and uh, got there through Jadam. So check it out if you don't know it. Yeah, I mean, it, to be honest, it sounds too good to be true at first, uh, especially if somebody's been growing synthetically to think that you could reuse your soil. So that's why there's such shortcuts now by being able to listen to, to gentlemen like Kevin, where you can kind of like within a, a year or two, like we've kind of mentioned several times, even, you know, on this show is uh, think of it as a four year. If you want to go commercial, if, you're, if this is your dream in life is to grow cannabis at scale, uh, then it's going to take you four years, in, in my opinion. And so you dial in those first two years to where you're profitable and a perpetual healthy harvest and then those last two years you just start to dial in and kind of make a brand for yourself understanding these elite genetics and whether you end up in the gray market at scale or in the in the legal aspect at scale you still need to manage these systems pretty much the same way uh, and there's a lot of money in it if you can manage at scale with these jadam knf all the buzzword type stuff. If you understand all of those umbrella terms, then you can kind of battle that, teach your team these things at a certain uh, level, and you're going to be able to bring down how much it costs to actually run those, uh, especially those large MSO type uh, organizations. They're used to spending a comical amount of money just to be able to, especially in labor, to get the plant from seed to sale. And so this is the new frontier, the stuff that Kevin is teaching you. Nobody, when I was trying to do this in Denver, took anybody that was saying this kind of stuff with any legitimacy whatsoever. It was almost like you were going in and talking to the suits about wizardry and voodoo and all this kind of stuff. Nobody believed it. And so you guys are sitting here on a Friday night uh, listening to what we're kind of saying. And that's why there is a playbook here that Kevin has given you. There's a playbook here and, and uh, products that Mark has given you. And I hope that you guys see that I try to add where I can and stuff, but I'm also not uh, PhD intelligent, like Kevin was saying. There's there's times where I have to like go back and double and triple read things because sometimes I forget stuff. But if you know those weaknesses with this living soil system and you do fuck up a little bit, it's more forgiving. And so you don't get frustrated with this. You find success. And then there's a lot of ways that you can continue down and make a better life for yourself by just understanding how to grow cannabis. Because if you're trying to grow something else in life, it's a lot easier once you've mastered. Well, maybe not mastered. But once you've gotten a lot of the these kind of principles down, growing tomatoes in your backyard is comically easy now. Yeah, and honestly... Point. Um, the only thing I was so uh, screaming demon cannabis said Jadam microbial solution JMS is awesome and easy, and it's a perfect example of of uh, the ease in Jadam, you know, because um, 
you know, that is basically the, that is the IMO. That is your microbials. That's all you need. And to find that process, um, you know, all, all you have to do is add some leaf pulp or some leaf mold, I'm sorry, from like out in the backyard as close to your house as you possibly can. So don't go too far. Um, and then throw it in a bucket of water with some potatoes or some other starch uh, uh, and sugar and and you're good to go. So, uh, sorry, someone's walking in on me here. Um, but yeah, no, oh. sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um, you know, the reason I got into Jadam kind of pivoted off of natural, you know, KNF as it, as it's defined is, uh, you know, I'm sitting at home with two little kids. One of them's in my arm. The other one's running around, I'm like, how the hell am I going to garden in my backyard? You know what I mean? Like, how is this going to happen? Like, I, I want to do it regeneratively. I want to do it thoughtfully. And I wanted to do it naturally. You know, so I'm like natural farming, natural farming. And then to find those those free Jadam videos on YouTube, uh, the, all the free information that they have online. Man, it, the best, like, two hours of your life that you can spend is go watch, like, videos one through ten um and it's narrated and it's he, the dude uh i don't know his name but he's the son of master cho correct or, or is he the grandson young, young son, son. son young son yeah that's right um funny guy man he just like great great attitude about everything funny guy and easy to listen to so that would be you know the best place to start if you wanted to go that route um and just you know, if you're looking for more, more, uh, I don't know if I want to say work, but like more, more input to the process, then maybe natural farming is, is your call. Um, but for me, I just didn't have the time and that's why I went with Jadam. So question for Ken. Yeah. Hit it, Bri. Can you end up with a salt buildup from using too much ocean and crustacean inputs? Of course, ultimately, yes, you can. But like, how much are you using? That's the thing. If you're using that much, that you're starting to see salt build up. You're using too much. If you're using it, be careful in a pot too. If, like a small pot, ocean stuff just always makes me nervous because I feel like it's gonna burn it quickly in a small pot. But if you're in a big bed, a a, a sufficient application every once in a while is is good i'm sure but i don't use any of that stuff i'll use i've made some fermented seaweed extract i always add like when i'm doing imo threes i always add seawater i have people send me seawater barter barter for it all the time from california to texas to florida and i always use a little bit of it but that's just for the 80 some minerals that's found in in the salt water itself so yeah, you can. I mean, really, you, you see salt buildup. I've seen salt buildup on pots. You know, if you, you start to see that white, that white little crust along the outside. So I'd assume if you're in a pot, look for that. Anyway, somebody else, y'all use that stuff? Not really, to be completely honest. Um, just, I mean, I'm in Michigan, so uh, I, I obviously use uh, crab meal um and sea based products but not like not like ocean water um and that's where i feel like you'd probably get a lot of the 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 salt build up um and i also don't use those inputs very heavily unless you know you're like the biggest use i have for for like uh um like crab meal and stuff like that is feeding my uh springtails because they love that shit and that's like super food for them so uh, i haven't noticed that there or really in my beds but i don't use it like it's not my go-to just geographically speaking um so there's another question on Instagram here from Screaming Demon. Has anyone experimented with adding American chestnuts or their husk to your IMO3? Muted, buddy. Sorry, I have not used those, but that's the whole point of organic should be experimental. 
they are offered in your environment therefore you should start to use them that's the point that's the point of understanding this type of organic growing that i'm into is just looking around and seeing what has fallen down and it don't like people say don't use black walnut it'll make you know you'll it'll it'll bleach or it'll kill all the grass that you that you pour it on or they'll they'll say don't use too many pecans it makes it all acidic and all this stuff man it's like if you're overdoing it by half a truckload you're gonna probably have problems like too many too many pecan shells so half a truckload of pecan shells in one spot you're not gonna be able to grow in just that that will cause problems but the point is this mother nature's not dumping that much stuff anywhere to make that stuff happen so just go gather up what's in your area and if you got those american chestnuts in there use every single bit of it i would i would experiment in so many ways with those see if you can get some of them to pop you'll probably have to winterize them and stuff like that but um see if you can get a few of them to pop see if you can make a, a sprouted seed tea with some you could sprout some and then actually use those in the IMO3. I've done that before just as a, just to see if more enzymes would be in the stuff. I didn't test it, just a fun thing to try. But the again, the point being, that's your IMO3 input that you need to use in your IMO3. That's what your environment offers. Grab it and use it. Yeah, if you want to see the power of Mother Nature, start using sprouted seed teas, a variety of things you can use. Blue corn was something that, uh, you could sprout really easily alfalfa seeds chia seeds is another one like remember when you would see the late night ch -ch -ch chia and it have like the weird pig or whatever uh that's obviously chia seeds that, that you can grow on it that's how easy that thing is to grow there's a ton of protein uh within those if you actually take them uh as a human being there's a lot of benefit to it so you can play around with this kind of stuff and um to highlight that question from earlier in my opinion, if you're building raised beds, one of our secret sauces was to lay out lobster and um, crab meal. Uh, it's kind of like a, a ground up formula. It stinks. But if you put it out soon enough with the uh, spray tails, they'll start to break that down. And so that's kind of like if you start to build these big like four by four or whatever, the larger uh, pots and all that kind of stuff, uh, it takes forever for that to break down. So even if you're building out rooms and, you know, these were kind of the secrets that you can use uh, when we were in Oklahoma and stuff, we would have these soil systems being growing while the room was being built out and covering them as best we can. And that part kind of sucked. But uh, we aren't always put the crab meal down first because it took so long for that stuff to break down. But for whatever reason, the, the springtails would start to break it down first. Uh, and then you would add the, the composting worms. And then that seemed to be the catalyst because you had done that weeks before or months before how long it however long it took to build a room out uh that that is part of that kind of like insurance policy for whatever reason if you start that early enough and add that crab and, and in my opinion if you want to add the lobster there's something to that extra chitin that's in there uh that really allows it to be a healthy soil system when the plants start to grow yeah, and uh, Goathead Garden said malted barley, and I was going to kind of uh, say something about that because um, one of the things that, you know, I don't know, I don't honestly know what the effect is on my um, on my beneficial organisms, but uh, with my Benny Boost that I make, it's, mal it's not malted barley, it's sprouted barley. We sprouted ourselves. It's blue corn we sprout ourselves, and it's um, lentils that we sprout ourselves. And using that, uh, the, uh, you know, the sprouted seed aspect of it, using that in horticulture, obviously the benefits are definitely there, which is why we started sprouting these. But what we found is that the, the you know, rove beetles and um, other beneficial organisms, especially uh, red wiggler worms, they love that shit. Um, it is an absolute superfood throttle to the floor booster if you're trying to build, you know, worm populations or beneficial populations in your soil, which is why, you know, at first when you introduce these the biodiversity packs, you know, don't don't you don't necessarily need to feed anything to these things for like the first month because they're going to work on those gnats and you want them hungry and working on the gnats. 
But after that, when they run out of food, they need something to sustain on. So that's why we recommend dusting your, you know, your soil every two to four weeks, something somewhere in there with Benny Boost. For whatever reason, it just keeps them in a standing army approach. Um, and, you know, again, I don't know if, if uh, just skipping the sprouting process would, would be the same outcome with the, with the beneficial organisms, but it's, I don't honestly, I do honestly think that the sprouting has something to do with it, releasing those enzymes and proteins and stuff like that. Cause that's what these bugs are ultimately looking to eat. So um, that, that was my kind of experiment with the bugs and it, it works great, man. And I, that's why I sell it. It's my secret sauce. You know, it's, uh, it's definitely something people should be using to keep those bugs uh, ready to go. There's something special about the blue corn. So I don't know, Kevin, if you have any like knowledge or insight into that, but for whatever reason, I learned that yeah. from, from like the early days of build a soil and stuff that adding that and kind of the chia seeds and all these kind of different seeds, acorns, uh, avocados is another example of that. For whatever reason, when it is a seed, there's something special to it. And there's a reason why the wet, red wigglers take over. And the road beetles seem to just grow like crazy in those little uh, avocado tech bombs. So play around with this kind of stuff. And, and I think you guys will see that it's a lot easier once you have your worm bin going to do anything in soil capacity. And that's why I, that's, I, mean, I always have that going. When I walk into my isopod room, the first thing I do is, uh, if it's been a day or two, is look at the, the worm bin. And then I assess everything else. And I just like... I don't know, man. I just know that if anything is wrong with those bins, I just come and drizzle it out or I make another purchase and, uh, and figure things out. But because Mark's stuff is so effective, I can grow in these large ass fish tanks uh, without a lid. And I know that my uh, competitors can't do that because of the they don't understand really rove beetles and hypiosis miles and orbited mites and the whole the whole gamut. So this kind of stuff allows you guys to manage systems as well. So I don't manage plants anymore, but I'm still managing all these different little utopias that we used to do. It's just isopods now. And the ones that I do have, in at least certain ones, are at the same value of some of these genetics. Like some of these things are, are actually kind of silly with, with the price points, but they're so hard to breed that that's why people are willing to pay for them. You know, it's, it's kind of that, however, the supply and demand kind of thing. When people can't get something, whatever reason they want it more. So that is that skill set. And I think from learning from these guys for the past year, understanding IMOs from Marco and then understanding IMOs from Kevin, it's like a whole little, like, I get to see the world through two different lenses, but at the same time, for the most part, they say the same thing. And then when Mark's kind of giving you the Benny Boost tip and all that, I, it's just tried and true things that he's telling you that you can back up by early videos. Like there's something special about sprouted seed teas and there's definitely something special about sprouted seed trees when you use blue corn specifically. I don't know why that is, but I, I hope that you guys play around with it. Oh yeah. Let's, let's get into yeah, that. part. The, it just says that the blue corn, the blue corn has a much higher, much higher levels of protein than any other corn any other species of corn is that certain type of blue corn. So that, that's definitely why. Well, that's what the old heads would always talk about is that there's no, never enough protein as well. Everybody's thinking carbohydrates, but what about the proteins that everybody needs? And there's not enough there. So what happens is, uh, or at least in the isopod world, they actually eat each other. So there's something to just kind of making sure that everybody's got enough resources that everything's thriving, whether you're growing the plants, uh, or, or a, uh, manage it kind of like a bug system. I don't know what to call Mark and I when we manage these things, but managing a ton of different bugs, uh, there has to be ways to kind of cut down that labor because it's extremely labor intensive uh, to manage all these things. And I can't imagine if you didn't have mother nature working with you, how much more of a labor intensive thing that would be having gnats and everything fly in your face, moths, uh, just kind of the common things with, that you see when plants are taken over. Uh, it's gross. I mean, everybody here has probably had white flies fly in their mouth. It's fucking gross, man. In your eyeball, in your yeah. ear. Feel gross. You, you, yeah, you I, use Mark, a Q-tip. I've got to get. I've got to get some of that uh, Benny. 
that Benny dust you sell. I got to get some in my, I want to get some in the compost, get it going. I've got white, I've got flies, little fungus gnats and crap like that right now in gasoline alley. They're not, again, they're not so bad that I actually want to be like, do anything about. I just put sticky traps out and, and they are, it is what it is. But the next indoor grow, I want to have, I want to have that in control as best I can through some type of bioactive substance. Hell yeah. Love to, love to set you up and we, we can definitely, uh, definitely do that. I'd love to, um, get your feedback and, um, all that fun stuff. What's that? Einkorn? Einkorn. Einkorn. I don't know what that is. To be I don't know what it honest. is. Rick, what it, what's einkorn? You grow it on your land? Is it wild? He's so far east 410 on instagram just commented that uh beneficial soil mites have gotten out of hand ever since i put a soil cover on the top layer i wonder if that if he means a uh, cover crop or if he means uh an actual like bimini top <laughs> like uh plastic cover for like a earth box I, I mean if he's talking about those orbited mites i've seen that before when i've used um uh like a cover uh like a burlap sap sack kind of thing and that's why we always talk about using um a cover crop because for whatever reason the worms will self-regulate and it seems like the uh the road beetles self-regulate without you know putting in the boosts of avocados and stuff and then eventually the orbited might self-regulate i've noticed there's brown ones and then there's white ones that kind of look like these blobs and they don't really move I mean, it takes a while, I guess. More like a sloth, I guess. It would take weeks, and I would notice that they would kind of move. But the the brown orbit, it might seem to move a little bit quicker. So I'm sure Mark could talk more on that. But I've never seen it, even if it gets out of control for a second, be anything but a positive thing as long as you kind of manage it. And maybe slow down feeding uh, organic matter for a couple of days. Same thing, like if you got fungus gnats, you wouldn't just continue to water. Uh, those are the kind of things. Like you let, you let your foot off the gas a little bit, and then you just, just to reassess. Yeah, you really want those those mites to be kind of sitting at at bay, ready to roll. So when you do have that influx of moisture, or you have that flux of food going on, that is your buffer, right? Like they are like the I, I truly strongly feel that the predators are a big reason why uh, biodiversity works against gnats and thrips and other soil. Um, breeding you know where they're young their larval stages go in the soil um i think that that healthy competition like that really really aggressive competition um is what is truly what's going to stop the issues um so having like seeing that is really just like like yeah okay it could be you could if your plan is happy then it's not telling you anything other than you have all these these organisms that are ready to rock and roll when you feed. So if your plant's not looking happy and it's clawing and droopy or, you know, doing weird things, um, it could be, uh, you know, it could be that you're overwatering. you got to look at other things. But those mites on their own um, will do nothing other than, uh, kind of what we talked about earlier in the show is like that's why you don't want to put those little seeds in there because those guys are ready to roll. Uh, you got to have a plant with some legs before you drop it into the diversity. Um, so, uh, and yeah, Brian, you're right. I think they're called grain mites, those white ones. They're just really slow moving. They look like eggs. Um, they're nothing to worry about. They come and go like you wouldn't believe. Like one day they're there, the next day they're gone. When they're done with their work, they recede and disappear into the ether. So um, they're great to have there, man. Yeah, I don't think, unless you're seeing something flying, because even springtails, they don't fly. They, they jump. That's where they get their name. Um, then most of the time it's beneficial. So when you're trying to figure these things out as a newbie, uh, just kind of take that to heart. Like, is it just running through the soil system? More than likely, it's all right. Even if it's a, a non-beneficial or an ant or something like that, as long as it's not overbearing, you don't see them starting to build a colony. I've always let that stuff kind of go. And now that I've uh, gone kind of full circle and understood road beetles at, uh, at a 
hopefully a higher level than back in the day. Uh, it does seem to be like that is kind of the problem solving. And then to take it to the next level to be proactive is when you get more into the like the beneficial ways, the predator ways. You got something on that, bud? Got nothing. My eyes are bloodshot. Look at them. Woo! I got ripped on this right here. Take it to the dome. Oh yeah, is that one of those ones you can stick in the dab rig and hit like that too? Have you seen those? Yeah, this is this is just pure this is pure hash rosin in there man it's a it's all glass insides and it's beautiful it never burns i got it from oh, yeah. scissor tail solventless he's got he's trying out some new vape pins and all those things he still can't do anything unbelievable here in oklahoma omma has shut him out he's just waiting he's got all of his licenses everything he's supposed to do is done they just have to say go that's it it's nuts but that right there got me ripped. It's well, about those, a... boys. It's about gardening time. If everybody is not aware of that, the first thing y'all ought to be doing is putting some potatoes in the ground. If you can, you can put potatoes and onions in the ground for sure. Right now. Won't bother them one bit. If they get any kind of frost later on, y'all, you can start. If you're wanting to grow tomatoes, now's the time to start popping seeds. Sunflowers, start popping seeds. Cucumbers, you can start seed popping and all that stuff because we're getting, what, we're middle of February already. So you get towards the end of March, and it's ready, it's ready to rock and roll. I'll have plants outside. I'll have all kinds of stuff going on by then. I cannot wait. So prepare. Now's the time to get ready, get your garden ready. Yeah, and this year I'm going to be putting up the plastic on my, my greenhouses uh, early in the season so I can utilize that space to get my, you know, once I get seedlings, then like you said, because we're in Michigan, our planting season really isn't safe until about June 1. So, um, you know, to have that buffer, I'll be able to get out there in March probably, maybe, maybe April probably more realistically just because of those night freezes. Um, but, uh, definitely going to be starting my seeds coming up here soon. And even my cannabis, uh, all my cannabis stuff, I, I like to have really good legs on that stuff, uh, and have time to sex them and no, you know, cause I don't have, I'm not, I'm not looking for, gen, I'm not looking to breed. I'm just looking for good females that are going to, you know, hopefully get me some good rosin at the end of the season here. So um it gives me the time that i need and you know i can adjust any issues before they head outside get them nice big huge root balls going so that they're ready to just explode when i get them out there so um hoorah let's friggin' go no i'm ready so that einhorn is a super high flower high protein flower pre-genetic altering wheat sounds special that's something to look into for sure yeah like horn it sounds like some kind of vine to me sounds like that ezekiel bread that supposedly is like a biblical recipe yeah, yeah we made that you... stuff dude it's heavy as a brick yeah it's dense as can be it, you will chew on it for a while it's meant to sustain you anyway We've made it. It's pretty good. I wouldn't eat it much, though. <laughs> well, so, guys, this is probably a good spot to uh, kind of wrap this thing up. Uh, we like to keep this show to about an hour on Fridays, and um, we really appreciate all the questions we got tonight. And, again, you know, that's the whole purpose of this is not necessarily to sit here and obloviate on our own topics, um, albeit the things that we're thinking and talking about are probably – a lot of the things that might be going on over there uh but but on the contrary um we love to have stuff that reminds us of of old plights or just gets our minds thinking a little bit uh gets us uh researching kind of like this einhorn stuff uh einkhorn um you know really appreciate that that feedback and that input here this is a, this is an open forum show and uh Without you guys and your participation, it's it's really it's not the same. So appreciate everybody's time here tonight. Um, before we sign off, does anybody have any shout-outs real quick? 
Muted. You're muted. Sorry, shout out Kid Mac if he's still on here. He might have passed out on us. But go to okcalyx.com. You can find some genetics. You can find a bunch of bundles and all kinds of stuff. Okcalyx.com. Check it out. Uh, yeah, um, you know, obviously rubber ducky isopods if you want to support the brands. Uh, now it's shopterrariumtribe.com as well. I'm part owner in that one as well. So if you want to support us, uh, you want to do a terrarium or you want to do isopods or you want to pick our brain, uh, it allows, you know, being an entrepreneur allows us to be able to do this kind of stuff. And I'm just uh, really grateful because I'm learning a lot of things to be able to monetize uh, just by sitting here with you guys. So there's a lot to just kind of giving and being genuine with uh, your knowledge and gifts, because I think when people reciprocate and give that back to you, um, I don't know, it just minimizes the, the amount of work and labor that I have to do. And at least in the reptile world, nobody really understands this stuff yet. So some people that are deep into isopods, uh, like myself and my family, look at us like we're wizards because we understand this stuff. And you guys, you know, a lot of you that, that are sitting here on Friday nights, you know all this stuff as well. So go out there and monetize it. There's not a lot of people that know this. And if you aren't able to create it from yourself, then buy some IMO from Kevin. You get fungus gnats, you know, buy it. Buy a little uh, uh, beneficials from, from him and understand that it takes time with this kind of stuff. So being proactive, uh, like if I if I started my brand new worm bin, I would be putting in uh, the beneficials right away. I mean, that would be step one. And then it would probably be once those are kicking off, uh, like he had mentioned, eating the fungus gnats, I would add the, the crustaceans. Um, so it would be, I personally like using crab and lobster and shrimp. Uh, when it, when I eat it personally from a good source, and I notice if you go to the shittier uh, grocery stores, like when I grew up, it was called Food Lion. I don't know if y'all y'all got that in Oklahoma. Yeah, you know you're poor when you're shopping at Food Lion, but they would they got caught for a bunch of stuff. But if you eat the shrimp and that kind of stuff from there, uh, it's just not the same thing. And so spending a little extra money at Costco uh, really goes a long way when you're trying to to build up a healthy colony for whatever reason, man. That shrimp is not, it doesn't create a vibrant, uh, I don't know what, same thing with organic. Like when I, when I, back in the day when I wouldn't give them more uh, organic avocados, it, it didn't seem to pop off the same way. So for whatever reason, those chemicals might not necessarily harm uh, right away, but it does seem like over time that buildup and all of the, the add probably a lot of the salts and all of these other things, it starts to diminish. So I try to make sure that I don't, um, uh, put those in there. So that was a long-winded way to say that uh, I just appreciate everybody with this. Like 2020, 20, 2024, I think is a huge year for everybody that's understanding this stuff. And so coming up and, and kind of showing up every Friday, if you guys could just support this brand new show, it's extremely hard to get anybody to give a shit about your show. Everybody has a podcast, but I hope that you guys see that we're bringing value uh, and people have been asking for this value. That's why we've moved it to YouTube. Well said, bro. Appreciate you guys. Hope you have a great night. See you next Friday. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate you. Have a good week. See everybody.